The second points to the fact that at least one of Freud's speculative leaps is now gaining a contemporary neurological underpinning. Freud thought that dreams sprang from a deep core of personal wishes and fears. Mark Solms and a team of neurologists are proving just that, and doing so not by lying on the couch. The results have been extremely promising and extremely interesting. For example, one study that we did was to look at what part of the brain, when damaged, leads to a, a total cessation of dreaming. If you want to discover the brain basis of a mental function, then the first thing to do is to see, well, where does damage lead to a loss of that function? We expected to find that damage to the part of the brain that produces REM sleep, which most people have, uh, are now familiar with, we thought that damage to that part of the brain would lead to a loss of dreaming, but it doesn't. In fact, despite the high statistical correlation between dreaming and REM sleep, the two things are not one and the same. These are two different things, REM sleep and dreaming, although they co-occur, are in fact two different neurological entities. That's an important insight. So then the question becomes, well, where is the damage that leads to loss of dreaming? The theoretical interest fell on the frontal lobes of the brain, just behind the eyes. It's called the ventromesial quadrant of the frontal lobe. I'm sorry for the technical term. This is the part of the brain that the old psychosurgeons, as they were called, used to target in the modified prefrontal leucotomy, this operation that they used to do for the treatment of psychosis in the 40s and 50s, 60s. Damage to that part of the brain leads to a loss of dreaming. It also leads to amelioration of the psychotic symptoms, and it also leads to a loss of motivation in general. And some people think, in, in my view, quite, quite legitimately, that the reason that these patients' symptoms improve is because they lose interest in everything, including you know, the excitements that lie behind their symptoms. Now, it's very interesting that these patients, when they lose interest in everything, including whatever the excitements are that lie behind their symptoms, they also lose the capacity to dream. What study of these patients showed us, and study of this part of the brain showed us, is that dreams are generated by motivational mechanisms, that whatever else dreams might be, crucial to the construction, to the generation of dreams, is a motivational impulse. This part of the brain is not just motivational in some general sense, it's a source of, of cravings and instinctually driven needs. It's not, it's not just a matter of you know, polite interest in uh, the weather. You can see how immediately this suggests that, well, perhaps the conclusion that Freud and the early psychoanalysts were led to, which was that behind the perceptual surface of the dream, using psychoanalytic methods, one infers that behind this there's a deep impulse, a motivational impulse. When you look at the brain evidence, what you find is exactly the same thing. Such research has so far done little to establish a truce in the Freud Wars, probably because the battles are so fluid and many-sided. The most vociferous of these has been fought out in America and began there when psychoanalytic practice was at its peak, part and parcel of medical psychiatry and perhaps begging to have its authority toppled. John Forrester gives us a brief history. The Freud Wars, in their, their latest version, probably start with the attack of feminists on Freud but also the distrust of utopic Marxist political revolutionaries in the late 60s and 70s on anything that was psychological and which seemed to justify the system by blaming the individual. The attacks on Freud by feminists were vitriolic in the extreme and that was because they perceived Freud as making women dependent on men for their identities and the first claim of feminism was to assert woman's identity independently of any other social function. One wing of the feminist movement named men not only as usurpers of power, but as sexual aggressors, violators of women, and soon enough, of children. Freud served as a useful buttress. In his first case histories, the early and pre-psychoanalytic Freud had speculated that his patients' ills might be due to real sexual seduction in childhood. This Freud was seized upon in the 80s and 90s, and, in an unholy alliance, wedded to feminist therapists who saw all sex as abuse. Abuse which could start all too early, only to be remembered, recovered from amnesia, much, much later. And once returned from the repressed, via the therapist's couch, these recovered memories could make their way to court, attack fathers or mothers, seek claims for early abuse. The memory wars, with their maelstrom of emotion, evocative of early American witch hunts, were on their way. Adam Phillips. That there should be a memory war means there are a whole series of questions about our relationship to the past and the way in which we reproduce it that we are very uncertain about. 
people get more aggressive the more uncertain they are. So that what the stakes are in the memory wars must be very, very powerful. Through some strange theoretical conflations, Freud now not only became a cited authority for therapists who otherwise loathed him, he was also, for the other side, the very devil who had invented the much contested concept of repression and a slippery and suspect notion of memory. Freud is one of several very powerful writers really beginning to wonder about what kind of status we should be giving to memories. What we think of as simply documentary recall of the past is actually a kind of symbolic disguise that a lot of memory is more like dreaming than it is like documentary reproduction. You might think everything is at stake in memory. Who's in a position to decide whether you've really remembered something? And what does really remembering entail? And why does it matter whether you've remembered it or made it up? It's as though the, what was collapsing was the distinction between memory and imagination. In a litigious America, the inner life, the crevices of memory, went on trial and Freud with them, though he himself had always refused the role of expert witness, asserting that the truths and lies of the couch were not played out in the same register as those of the courts. Whose side, if any, are we to believe in these memory wars? Much of the present memory wars concern what are called repressed memories. And the idea of a repressed memory is that something dreadful happened to you a long time ago and you have repressed it, pushed it down, you can't remember it. Ian Hacking, who has written brilliantly on the subject. Now, the concept of repression is enormously important to Freud. In fact, in his account of the history of the psychoanalytic movement, he says that repression is one of the primary roots of psychoanalysis. Once he had discovered repression, psychoanalysis was underway. But what's interesting to me is that virtually never does Freud talk about repressed memories. There's only one sentence in 1915 which clearly talks about, in German, repressed memories. What he talks about are repressed drives. The notion of repressed memory is really a post-Freudian idea, and it has to do with the simplification of Freud, which I believe really started in the 1970s, when people started investigating uh, child abuse and the various disorders which were said to start from it. The one which I've been most interested in is multiple personality or what are now called dissociative disorders. It was claimed that people split themselves or dissociated different parts of themselves because they wanted to cover up some memory from the past and they called this repressed memory but a very curious kind of way in which we've forgotten our history and forgotten what Freud was talking about is the suggestion that really this comes from Freud himself. The people who talked about repressed memories hated Freud and yet at the same time lifted from Freud a particularly simplified and bowdlerized version of him. I have little doubt after this investigation into the century-long case of Sigmund Freud that caricatural uses of Freud's work will go on, as will debates concerning his integrity, his evidence, and the scientific status of his ideas. Freud seems uncannily irrepressible. He bounds up here, there, and everywhere in strange alliances and misalliances. The novelist Ian McEwan, a keen observer of matters scientific, sees a possible new place for Freud in neuroscience, which, oddly enough, was Freud's very point of departure. Often you have to be wrong in order later to be right. And in arriving at a theory of mind, we might then rediscover Freud in different terms and lift him uh, not wholly out of myth and back into science, but at least partially. And I'm thinking of two things. One is the discussion of emotion, which is central to Freud, has been more or less absent from the discussions of neuroscience and has not played a great part in mid-century psychology nor has it played a, a great role in understanding what consciousness or selfhood is. But lately that's begun to change. Another central emerging element in a modern theory of mind based on something organic is the role of memory. Memory as a key part of our identity. And again, it's not been an important concern for psychology. But as neuroscience discovers the relation of selfhood to memory, it again reaches back to Freud. So, just as we had to have alchemy before we had chemistry, as we had to have Aristotle before we had a, a scientific revolution, so we might discover that our contemporary theory of mind rests heavily on Freud in ways that we are surprised at.
Whether our new century will focus on Freud as the creator of a provocative literary oeuvre, or as the founder of a talking cure, through which, as he said, profound misery might be transmuted into ordinary everyday unhappiness, or as a visionary scientist of the mind, or indeed as a bogus mythmaker, is up to posterity. Only one thing is certain. We're bound to remember the case of Sigmund Freud. People did not believe in my facts and thought my theories unsavory. The struggle is not yet over. The case of Sigmund Freud was presented by Lisa Opinionazzi and produced by Mark Berman.